Okay, yeah. As I say, it's a pleasure to be in this beautiful city. Thanks, the organizer, for the invitation. Uh, I want to talk about uh, Norway Shudori, maybe quantum Norway Shudori, a bit of quantum geometry. I'm not sure we'll have time to talk about everything in this uh, title here. This is a, a work in um, uh, published, but also in progress with Luca Ciambelli and Rob Lee. So uh, it's a, you know, the beginning is really uh, uh, what we have been doing in the past years. Uh, by we, I mean uh, all collections of, 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 of people, big communities, understanding much better what is the, the geometry of null surfaces and, and the canonical structure that, that is uh, uh, along null surfaces. And that allows us to kind of revisit this uh, old idea of the membrane paradigm that somehow gravity project itself onto a, a fluid type of fluid theory on null surfaces. So the, if I look at the generic uh, 3D null manifold, I'm going to just look at the portion of the null manifold away from the caustics in my talk. So the basic Carolian structure, as we know, is this uh, null vector. You know, the fi there's a fiber bundle here on the Carolian structure. So the, the, the lines of the bundle are along LA, and then there's a metric which is degenerate, which, uh, you know, uh, uh, label the kernel of this, of this bundle. So uh, for gravity, it's going to be useful to introduce the ruling, which is a one form dual to the, to the Carolian vector here. And once you have a ruling, you can uh, decompose the volume form into uh, uh, a volume form associated to the cot C and, and K, which is this one form. And then using this ruling, uh, you can define a, a, an horizontal projector that allows you to define what you mean by uh, horizontal forms and horizontal vectors. Okay, so these are the basic uh, geometrical element of the Carolian geometry. The analogous is kind of the analog of uh, what is a metric on a time-like surface or on a, on, a, on a surface. And my perspective is going to be very holographic, so I'm not going to necessarily think of this surface as being embedded or embeddable, although, you know, in the end it, it is. Uh, but the Carolian geometry elements allow you to describe, uh, you know, the geometry of null surface as some kind of intrinsic object. So once you have this data, a very important object is the expansion tensor that measures how the, the metric, you know, changes in time here. Uh, and then uh, we decompose this, uh, this uh, expansion tensor into uh, the shear, which is uh, traceless, and uh, the expansion, trace component. So any basic questions about the Carolian geometry? If everyone is a, you know, expert Carolian geometer, that's good. So this is kind of the kinematical part of the, uh, of the Carolian geometry, of course. When we do geometry, it's not enough to give you the metric. I need to choose a connection. And so uh, um, now we're going to work with uh, the notion of a Carolian connection. So, you know, the Carolian connection for me is going to be, because it's gravitational, it has to be uh, torsionless. And, and uh, of course, we want a connection that preserves the geometry uh, on null surfaces, this is not possible because of the expansion. Uh, but the best we can do is, uh, is, uh, is have a connection here that we call D DA, which in some sense preserve the connection if I project A along L, for instance, or if I project only index indices to be horizontal. So in general, this is uh, uh, the axiom of a Carolian connection is that it, it has to satisfy this uh, this kind of conservation law for the metric here in terms of the, of the stress tensor so that uh, this uh, 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 expansion contraction, the derivative of the metric with the covariant derivative gives you back the expansion tensor. Okay, and then of course I, so what, what else are, okay. Once you have a, a, if you have a connection like that, it's also very useful to take the, the, the derivative of the volume form. In a Carolian space time, the derivative of the volume form is not conserved. And you know it's encoded into this uh, boost connection. Uh, it's a boost connection because if I rescale the, the, the volume form, this object transform as a, as a connection. And then this boost connection, uh, I'm going to decompose it in terms of the uh, uh, object which is horizontal and then the object which is uh, uh, transverse, so proportional to this uh, ruling form here. This here, kappa, is the surface gravity of the null surface, and pi, uh, um, you know, the, the horizontal component of the, of the connection is what plays the role of, uh, if you want, the, the fluid uh, momenta. Okay? So this, these are the, the geometrical element, pi, k, uh, the shear, and the, and the expansion. 
Ah, it's transverse to L. So yeah, when I decompose these this objects, they are always uh, transverse to L. Yeah. Okay. Omega along L is K, and omega I is transverse to L. Okay, and these objects are, are, are transverse. Okay, um, okay the, the last element of the connection is that once you have the boost connection, uh, you can redefine, you can rediscover the expansion tensor simply as the derivative of L along, along, along the, the connection okay? uh, with that object. So these these are the kind of geometrical elements of the uh, of the connection uh, of of null geometry. And for some reason, it took us many many years to figure out exactly how to characterize it. But it it, it it's it's just in one slide. Okay. So when you talk about Carolian geometry, you have a metric and connection. That's it. Okay. Ruled ruling. Uh, okay. Is that any question on that? This the, these objects are going to play a fundamental role. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's torsionless. So this is the best I can do. It's torsionless. No, no, really, this is the best I can do. Yeah. No, no, in torsionless, like it cannot be. I cannot have zero because it has to be proportional to the. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't want torsion. I'm. I'm. I'm I, yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I'm. I'm not doing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing gravity, so I'm using the, yeah. In my case, I really, I want, I want a connection that comes, uh, that, you know, is defined holographically, but also comes uh, as the pullback of the bulk levitivita connection. Yeah, it's a choice. That's, that's what I'm going to work with. I, I want a connection that also map when I go, if I stretch my horizon, I go time-like, I can map it to, to the usual notion of connection in time-like surface. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a choice. This subject is not preserved, it's the expansion tensor. Yeah. Now it's important, there's the, for, for the non-specialist, there's two notions of connections, the one that preserves the frame and the one which is torsionless. That's the torsionless one. Yeah. No, no, I don't have any torsion there. This connection is torsionless. Okay. Uh, no, I do. The ecstasy curvature is going to be the, so this is part of the ecstasy curvature on, on the, there's two normal here on C. Uh, the ecstasy curvature of C inside the, the surface is theta. The ecstasy curvature of C uh, inside the bulk is controlled by the, the, <coughs> the covariant derivative of K. Okay. Um, this connection, so very important, this connection is not unique, but the non-uniqueness of the connection labels radiation. So what we understand now is that uh, a choice of connection, a Carolian connection, is the proper covariant way, if you want, to define what you mean by radiation on a null surface, arbitrary null surface. At infinity, in fact, this is the, the way H.T. Karp kind of formalized the Gerock definition of connection as a choice of, of Carolian connection. So this is really the, the right way to think about uh, uh, okay, so the metric is kind of the kinematical data. The connection, if you want, is the, the choice of radiation, radiative structure. And it's beautiful because we know now what radiation means, if you want, in, in, a, in, a, in a covariant setting for finite surface. Yeah. <laughs> so all, all you need to specify is how, so dA plus omega A of KB is going to be a tensor, theta AB. Theta bar AB, and that's, that's the object. Different choice of theta bar AB is different choice of uh, radiative structure. Okay. No, horizontal. It, it's, uh, I didn't want to write it because I, I don't, I'm not going to use it. It's kind of irrelevant for all I'm saying. But the. Uh, KB, theta bar. No, this one has a, there's a, it's horizontal. And then, uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, the torsionless fixes every, everything else you can have it. This is the only thing you left. So uh, in the end, the free data is this W and the, and the radiation. So that, that's it. Yeah, yeah. 
No, that's right. It's kind of a, it's kind of simple. You go to infinity. This guy is zero, and then the boom, and then you only have the uh, you, you recover the definition of radiation by H to the car. Okay, so that that's the setting, and that's uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The ruling. So of course we're going to talk about that. The, the ruling. Uh, it's going to be uh, part of the symmetry I'm going to change k. So, uh, you know, there's two ways to think of it as uh, some kind of external background structure like this morning that you, you I'm going to get rid of. I think that's that's the way uh, we can think of. Or you can include it in the phase space and we can look at the variation as a kind of a, some kind of goldstone. But I think it's, it's proper to think of it as some kind of background structure that you need. In the same way, I mean, People usually make a big, when you define a connection, you know, the connection depends on the choice of coordinate. It's not a tensor, so the same thing here. What matters is that you have a, you know, the ruling uh, enters the definition of the connection, and of course, uh, you have covariance property and there's a change of ruling. Okay? So that's the key, okay? If you choose which of the how you extend the coordinates from the certain thing to the Well, so far it does nothing. For me, it's I'm purely holographic here. It's purely a 3D object. I don't want to refer to the bulk here. Okay, so let's see. What? I'm not fixing K. Yeah, it's a choice. It's a choice. You are holographic, Well, later, later, but it also means I can, uh, I don't need to refer to the bulk for that object to exist, which is part of the, of the idea there. No, not necessarily. If you demand k to be closed, then it's a foliation. Yeah, yeah. So if you want, if you want to be even more structured, demand that it's foliation, you can restrict k to be a closed, uh, a closed form. Okay. At this stage, it's, it's very general, and that's as much as you can do to be to be fully covariant. So okay. So now, uh, uh, why do we need this connection? The beautiful thing is that we have understood. I mean, it's been known for a long time. In some sense, it goes back to the fluid gravity perspective, membrane paradigm, the gravity projected on the surface. It's kind of a, it's kind of a fluid, you know, system. But uh, personally, and I was not the only one, we got confused for many, many years because most of the literature tried to understand the Damore equation as some kind of Galilean equation. Uh, but you know, uh, Laura, which is here, and and in this work, you know, and then others, uh, you know, for me it was the first time I realized, oh, it's obvious that it has to be Carolian. It's obvious today. It took us. Uh, 40 years to realize that. Once you understand that, then we can backtrap and, and repackage this entire membrane paradigm in something much more rigorous and, and solid. And so, uh, and of course, there's other you know, work by Luca and Marios and other people going there. So how does it work? The first thing is that if you want to uh, describe these things as some kind of fluid mechanics, you need to uh, discover what is the, the stress tensor. And the stress tensor is kind of the most, once you have this Carolian connection, the stress tensor is this most natural object you can think of, you have a preferred vector, uh, and you take the derivative of that preferred vector uh, uh, with the trace reverse condition here. This object DALB is, uh, is usually called the Weingarten <laughs> tensor, and this is the analogous of the astrisic tensor for null surfaces, if you want, except that, of course, it's intrinsic to the surface because L is, is parallel. Okay, so uh, you define this stress tensor, and you can think of it as a, a null analog of the Brown-York uh, stress tensor, right? Uh, and then uh, what you can show is that uh, Einstein gravity projected uh, uh, along N is essentially a conservation law for this stress tensor. So suppose that there's no matter source, then essentially it would tell you that, uh, uh, you know, the, the dBTAB is conserved, is equal to zero. Otherwise, it's sourced uh, uh, by, by the matter that crosses the the null surfaces, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, it's, it's not, well, if you do it, something very singular, yes, you can. But that, the proper way is really to think, so you, you could, you could, but you have to renormalize. Or, or the best way is really to think about uh, what I call a stretched horizon. That is to look at the, the, the geometry of time-like surfaces, but ruled by null radiation. If you think physically, the ruling that we all experience is not a, a ruling by a, by a space-like vector, it's a ruling by light. Okay, so this is kind of the physical ruling of physical systems. So if you take, if you take a ruling of time-like surface by null radiation, 
uh, then you can just recover this object a little bit more. But it's, yeah, that's why it took a while. It's not exactly the, yeah, it's, not, it's not simple. People have done it. It's, I can show you references. I think Laura has done it, uh, Anthony. It's not that, it's, it's a little bit complicated. But, but you can define it intrinsically like that. Yeah, there's some, the, the, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it took, it took uh, the history is a bit rocky, but the beauty is that now we are past that rocky times and we are in the sunny, sunny side. The we can the the yeah this is it this is it this is it this is uh, it it can, you know yeah so it's exactly like like for for a time like surface okay so all these different uh, historical uh, perspective they all boil down to this very simple formula there's a conservation law if you project a long time uh, you get the conservation of energy which is the ratio of the re equation and we're going to go uh, back there um, was a question before. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, and there's a notion of radiation, which is the beauty. The beauty is that now we have a, we have a definition of radiation. You see, the the normal is the is the light. You know, it's the light ray which is arriving at me. My I have a world line and somebody is shining light rays, and then it, it defines a ruling. So it's a ruling by light rays, a physical ruling that defines radiation. So that, this, it's all in this definition of the Carolian connection. So that that's why I say it's, it fits in one side, but it repackages. Uh, you know, years and dozens of years of confusion. But at the end, okay, as we're going to see, this is the, uh, okay, so now you project this conservation equation along, along L, you get conservation of energy, and the conservation of energy for this particular tensor is the null ratio de equation. Um, uh, and uh, you project uh, horizontally and you, you get a conservation of momenta. And for people who are fluid mechanicians, they, they re, you know, they, they, they look, it looks exactly like, like the same where it, you, know, you have a bulk viscosity, which is uh, one in uh, uh, eight pi g equal one unit. Uh, the interesting factor here is this uh, uh, pressure tensor. So here you see that uh, usually you have a you know, derivative of mu uh, uh, where the pressure appears. Uh, it appears with the opposite sign. So it's the, the opposite of a pressure is a surface tension. Okay? And the surface tension uh, which appear here, it's, it's, it couples to the, to the fluid expansion, and it, uh, it appears here, plays a key role in our story. Um, and it's the combination of the, of the uh, uh, surface gravity, okay? The infinity plus the expansion. Okay, there's no choice here, it comes from gravity. Okay, so that's kind of the new geometrical element, this mu here. Okay, and then the source are, are, are just the usual source. No matter, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. This equation. So where was the confusion? I think it's you know be in the, in the more. I think in uh, you know when I mean these these equations were written. Uh, you know, uh, this is ratio two and this is the more. Uh, I think I think a lot of people, you know, try try to understand this this uh, uh, the thermodynamics of, of null surfaces from a Galilean perspective. Right. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's why that's why the, that's why that's why I'm saying yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so people, pe people try to understand Navier-Stokes and the connection with Navier-Stokes, and it was kind of working, but never working exactly. So yeah, and then, and then uh, you know, since 2019, we, 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 we understand it in that manner. Um, 
Uh, as retrospect, you know, it could have been done much earlier. <laughs> maybe, and maybe some people along the way, yeah, anyway. Uh, Oh, it has uh, so the same decomposition. So uh, uh, the, the 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 stress tensor is the shear. I'm going to write it down. Okay. Uh, yeah. So the the yeah. Uh, let's say if it doesn't come back, ask me the question. So this is what I've just said. The Ashton projected to null surfaces is essentially uh, uh, not really. In that talk, I, I will forget about Damour. There's already a lot to, we can say about about uh, about null residuary, and Damour will will come next. So. Uh, okay, I'm going to work with this uh, unit, and that's kind of a, yeah, in fact, you connect very well with your talk this morning, where, where similar equations were written here. Uh, but I need to give you the, the yeah, here, here is going to be more precise. So, so the distress tensor, the Carolian stress tensor, I can decompose it into a, a horizontal and vertical component, where tau A is horizontal, and LB is my Carolian vector. Okay, and this, this, this is the pressure tensor. The pressure tensor has a viscous part and, and the pressure part. Okay, so mu is, a, minus mu is the pressure if you want. And then this vector here has a, has a momentum part and theta plays the role of the energy. Okay, so the expansion is the energy, uh, minus mu is the pressure, sigma is the viscous tensor, and pi is the heat flux. Does that answer your question? Yeah. 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 So in this uh, in this correspondence, let's say let's say it's an analogy. You know, uh, in this analogy, the energy of the fluid is, uh, is 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 proportional to the expansion. So now we know that if I have a fluid, you know, there's a canonical symplectic structure that that appears, and the Carolian symplectic structure is essentially that this component of the of the stress tensor is is the variable conjugated to the variation of the metric, whereas uh, this component of the stress tensor, this vector component of the stress tensor, is the variable conjugated to this uh, uh, Carolian vector. This morning, this was the, the Carolian Goldstone, if you want. Part of it was the Carolian Goldstone. Um, OK, so this is the canonical, uh, 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 if you want, fluid uh, simplicity structure. It is, the, it is directly connected to the Einstein-Hilbert uh, simplicity structure if you if you do the usual trick of uh, uh, adding a Gibbon soaking term, which is null here, the DALA, and then subtracting a corner term. Okay? So this is the connection between, let's say, the fluid perspective and the, the, the Einstein Hilbert perspective, which is fully covariant. Okay, so I'm going to forget about this change and I'm just going to, to focus on the on the fluid perspective. Because this is kind of a canonical transformation from the gravitational perspective. Okay? So this is why we have this kind of correspondence is that the gravity phase space projected on all surfaces is kind of a canonically equivalent to a, to a, a, a fluid a symplectic structure where Q and L plays the role of sources that you use to perturb your, your probe your fluid if you want. And a lot of people here are involved in that. Yeah. Uh, tau A will, will change. So this, this uh, in fact, TAB is invariant of the boost, but the split here is not. We, yeah, that's not obvious, but uh, I'm going to go to the, to, the, to, to, the, to the boost, yeah. So you can, you can look at how these variable changes and the changes of boost, that was part of the question here. But tau AB, TAB is, is an invariant on the, on the, on the uh, all boost. Which is quite normal. And the conservation law too is invariant. Yes? Yeah, 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 we're going to get there. We're going to get there. In fact, one of the results that we have obtained is a generalization of the focusing theorem, which was proven only for horizon on expanding to full general non null surface. So it's kind of a blows up the equilibrium condition to non equilibrium, if you want. Hopefully we'll get there. Oh, half an hour already. I mean, you know, I'm okay to stop, but let me let me see. Uh, okay, it's better that I go slow. I think you know that people understand. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so this is just a repeat of my chemical structure. So now, you know, the equivalence principle of GR is always the same thing, is that dynamics is simply an expression of the symmetry, right? So what is the symmetry? Uh, 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 is the deformorphism symmetry, and how, how does that appear? It appears in the fact that, you know, uh, um, essentially the manic deformorphism symmetry is the same as the manic that the neutral charge are coronal charges. Okay, so that the, the bulk of the neutral charges vanish. This is the constraint. So the, you're only left with the corner charge. So energy, you know, in gravity, this is the essence of the, of the holographic principle is that uh, in gravity, the energy is a corner integral. And so here, if we look at deformorphism, you can compute the, the, the contraction of along a, a deformorphism transformation of the symplectic structure, and you're going to get one term, which is your bulk constraint. Imagine there's no matter. Uh, and so demanding uh, deformorphism invariance, you mean you demand this seems to vanish, and you then you get the corner charge, which is essentially the, the, the evaluation of that uh, uh, stress tensor along psi, and epsilon b is just the contraction of the volume form along a db vector. Okay, so it's a, it's a dimension, co-dimension two integral here. Uh, okay, so when I impose a constraint, this is what I find, and my charge is just this corner charge. Now people were asking about what I call the lo local Lorentz transformation. So by local Lorentz transformation, I can either make an internal boost, just change the scale of K, or shift, you know, by an horizontal vector. Okay, and then, um, so the first thing, if I just do a shift, you can check that uh, the corresponding charge associated to it vanishes. What does it mean? It means that the shift symmetry, uh, which usually people call the Carolian boost symmetry, but the, there's, there's another boost. So I'm going to call it the shift symmetry. Uh, that changes k is pure gauge. So I don't care. It doesn't matter how I fix that object. Um, the boost is. Yes. Oh, because, yeah, because I'm, I'm exactly, because I'm looking at it along the, the null surfaces. Yeah, I'm not looking at, at the cut. Yes, yes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, so, if I just do a shift and I apply the charge, this equality is strong. That is, the, the charge vanish, and the, the vanishing of a charge is the expression of gauge symmetry. Uh, for the boost, it's a little bit more interesting. It's something in between, is that uh, if I make an internal boost, uh, it's what I call an edge mode symmetry. It means that the charge is purely a corner term, as it should be, but I don't have to impose a, a constraint to get there, okay? And so there's like three... If you want, there's three types of symmetry in this setting. Either you have a gauge symmetry, the charge vanish. You have an edge mode symmetry, which is that the charge is a corner term without imposing a constraint. And then there is the non-trivial symmetry, if you want, which are like deformorphism symmetry, which is just that the charge is a corner term, but you have to impose a conservation law. Okay? Uh, and so the, the general thing is that you can look at the once you have a, a symmetry group like that, you can look at what is the general group of symmetry that has non-zero charge. And the beauty is that it's absolutely universal. It's the same group for any null surfaces or even infinity, and that group is BMSW. Okay, I'm not going to maybe explain too much what BMSW is, but the beauty, remember, it's, it's, it's a general symmetry group. So there's no ambiguity about what is the symmetry group for an arbitrary corner. It's a group of symmetry that preserves the, the corner inside the null surfaces. Okay, and it contains the uh, deform. We're going to study part of that group. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I just use Noether theorem. So the, it's going to be the bracket of charge that comes from, from this symplectic structure. Because, because as, as Massimo was saying, we are, we are on the null. We have included the, the null symplectic potential. Uh, Oh, yeah, for the super translation. Yeah. For the super translation, so there's a, uh, yeah, BMSW contains super translation. The super translation activates the flux, uh, but there's a part of BMSW which is we call the corner symmetry part, which is the DFS times the boost, and that's the one which uh, I don't need the flux. Yeah. Otherwise, the same story. Yeah. So, strictly speaking, what you, I should call the symmetry group is really the corner symmetry group, it's a group that fixes one surface. The one that moves that surface, it's more subtle. But it is a universal structure, that's the beauty. And it was found by uh, Shanda Sekaran, Flanagan, on the study of geometrical structure of null surfaces. We found it studying uh, renormalization of, uh, 
of uh, asymptotically flat. And in fact, it's, it's, it's just a structure of noise surfaces. Yeah. It's, it's not BMS, so it's, it's, it's much more. BMSW is diff S, okay? It's very important. Times uh, vile S, if you want, and then times the super translation. The, yes. GBMS. Yes, yes, okay. Okay, so, so okay you, sorry, so you're not. No, yeah. you, you get the GMS or GBMS. Yes. Yes. Uh, the, the, the thing is that you have a conformal on the. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, but uh, how does it emerge? For me, you just have a Carolian surface. Yeah, yeah. So, when it is a node with a conformal. Well, I mean, it becomes conformal when I break the. the so, if you break the symmetry group. It's just that it's a symmetry breaking mechanism. So you have a DFS. If you give me a metric, uh, you can you can look at the conformal subgroup. Okay. So for each, so it's but it's a symmetry breaking mechanism. For each choice of the metric, you have a preferred subgroup, which is your conformal group. It's not that you have a preferred uh, conformal structure. Is that in fact even at infinity, you don't have a preferred conformal structure. You have many conformal structure. For each choice of conformal structure, you have a symmetry breaking mechanism down to BMS. The global BMS, which is a cell tool. Yeah, but the is because you have a bulk extension, and then uh, your BMS becomes also much more active as a bigger extension. As a conformal becomes more active. I was just wondering how it appears here with this arrangement. No, it's just that in 2D, every metric is, is, is there's only one conformal structure on this field. Oh, okay, so you mentioned the BMS bulk. Yeah, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, in 4D, in 4D, yes, yes. Okay. Yes, in 2D. There's only one sphere. <laughs> okay. So, so there's, there's, yeah, I know it's a trick. You know, dimension four is special. There are a lot of miracles that happen in dimension four that will not be true for air dimension gravity. Um, okay, so as I say, dynamics is an expression of deformorphism. Symmetry means I can think of all these uh, Einstein's equations simply as a, 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 a conservation law or flux balance laws, okay? Uh, but but I have a simple key structure, which means that, uh, and I'm, I'm a specialist of quantum gravity, so I want to quantize this object, which is quantum geometry. And, and uh, when I look at it, it's not much more different than the quantization we do at uh, infinity. And I say it's the same symmetry group. So let's go. And let's see how far we can go. And ro quite remarkably, as we're going to see, we can go very, very far. Uh, uh, and there's, there's a lot of reason why the structure on null surfaces is kind of universal there. Uh, so what's happening is that, um, so it's going to be useful to decompose this metric into, let's say, the, the, the volume form, the area form, omega, and then the, the part which is a determinant one, if you want, um, uh, uh, which is the shear form. Uh, and same thing for the, the volume form here. Omega can be factored out. And then we're going to see that this simple key structure splits naturally into something which contains spin zero degrees of freedom, spin one degrees of freedom, and spin two degrees of freedom. Uh, okay, so the spin, the spin two, we're used to it. This is the usual notion of radiation. The spin one, spin zero, usually we don't talk about it. Why? Because in QFT, we put them to zero. By definition, QFT is the, is the regime where the geometry does not fluctuate. These degrees of freedom, the area form fluctuating, becoming a quantum operator, this is quantum gravity. And there's no way effectively theory will ever describe fluctuating geometry. So. You know, I'm not saying that what I'm going to do is full quantum gravity, but between effective theory and full quantum gravity, there's certainly the regime where geometry is quantum. And so let's explore that. Okay? So, uh, ratio theory really only activates the spin zero and spin two. So for the moment, we're going to decouple the spin one sector, which is interesting in its own right. And then we can do that by, by kind of fixing the boost parameter such that the the, if you want, the, the Goldstone mode is fixed to, to not vary, and it's chosen as a background structure. Um, okay, I'm not going to explain how I do that. But, uh, you know, what I can do is that anytime I do a deformorphism or a variation, I, I can always correct by, by a local boost in order to achieve this, this variation. And that defines a kind of a restricted phase space where I can do the analysis. So uh, we do the analysis there, and then, uh, so this is what I call the prime phase space where this, this object is fixed. It goes back to one of the questions, when it's fixed, you're treating this k as some kind of background structure. 
there. And then uh, we can always decompose the deformorphism is in a part along the, the Carolian vector and the tangential part. And so here we're just going to focus on the time or parametrization, if you want, this f. Now, uh, as we have seen, the, 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 we have a constraint that, that generate that symmetry in the, in the bulk of my null surface, which is the ratio to the constraint. And uh, it's kind of the sum of three terms. There's a, a term which is essentially the energy of gravity waves. There's the energy of the matter field uh, multiplied by the volume form. And then there's a, a, a part uh, which is purely uh, Coulombic. Think about omega mu as some kind of the, the Coulombic field on, uh, projected on the null surface. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, when you compute the, the time or parametrization charge, you find that it's proportional to these constraints, which vanish in the bulk, plus a, a, a corner charge here, which is proportional to f and its derivative at the corner. And these are f and its derivative at the corner are kind of the two free data that fixes uh, time or parametrization. You tell me about time how I, okay. Um, okay, so when I impose the constraint, this is all I have, is that my, my, ch my symmetry charges now are pure corner charges, and they really only depend on, on f and its first derivative. So if you take a function which is, you know, with, with value and first derivative vanish, the charge vanish, and that means it's pure gauge. So I don't have to represent that at, at the curve, okay? So that's why you have a, a reduction of the degrees of freedom, if you want. Uh, on the symmetry. That's why the symmetry group is not the full diff n, but just this BMS W version. Okay, um, so this is, if I take the variation of the symplectic potential, I can write the, the symplectic form. Uh, okay, and then we see that mu, okay, we see very cleanly that mu and omega are conjugate variable, and then that the metric is conjugate to the shear. Okay, so that's kind of the, a little bit, and for people who are Familiar with infinity, it's uh, at least that part usually of the, the shear is conjugated to the news, okay? So it's uh, one object and it's time derivative. It's kind of the same here. And this is the radiation mode uh, here, and this is the, the Newtonian modes. So if you want to, I'm going to go fast on that because I want to focus on something else, but once you have that, you can just, uh, you, you can uh, invert the symplectic potential and, and compute uh, uh, the Poisson bracket. When I say you can, I mean, it took what, uh, Look, uh, four months. I mean, it took took a long time to do it, <laughs> but you know you, you can do it. Uh, 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 and then the geometry, the, the the best way to do it is kind of a, to parameterize the fluctuation of the of the geometry, the conformal structure in terms of a Beltrami differential here. Uh, introduce some propagator, which is essentially a theta function, but dressed by the holonomy of the connection. So the, all of these things are very geometrically very natural. This operator is simply the operator of the um, the, it's, a de, it's an inverse derivative operator along V, okay? And it contains part of the Carolin connection, and this one, in fact, what you can show is that this subject is a, is a conformal connection. So it's just, a, it's, a, it's naturally conformally uh, covariant, if you want. Okay. But that's, that's just uh, following the, the, the mathematics. And then you find, as I was saying, so you find the, the kinematical Poisson bracket, which is, Essentially, uh, this, this propagator that enters uh, everywhere is such that, uh, uh, you know, it connects, let's say if I look at uh, the two Beltrami differential, psi and psi bar, there's just two modes. These are the two graviton modes, right? left, right, helicity. Um, essentially, I get uh, this uh, uh, object, P P12, which is essentially a theta function. That is, it, it, it renders non-commutative things along null rays, but it's a delta function along different null rays. So there's no angular dependence. And that's, that's the beauty of Carolian geometry, is that you get this electric type of commutator where, where different null rays are completely causally disconnected, so they commute. And why is it important? Because as we're going to see, it means that effectively the dynamics of the theory on a Carolian geometry becomes one-dimensional. And we know a lot about one-dimensional Carol CFTs that we're going to see, uh, even non-perturbatively. And we can use this bag of tools there. Um, okay, so there's the, the, you know, the spin zero mode, which are conjugate variable. Here, X is always uh, VZ, Z and Z bar label points on the sphere, and V is a coordinate on the, on the null ray. Okay, and the uh, psi psi bar, okay, they, they, they connect in that manner. And then there's a mixing spin zero, spin two. Uh, that I don't have to. What matters is this structure. It's ultra local structure on the cut. Okay, so two points at two different points on the cut, they always commute. 
and then it's non commutativity on, on null lines. Okay, and this is this, this uh, ultra local structure is really the, the key, uh, it's the ultra locality of Carolian physics, and it explains why, why is it that I start, even in theory, where I start with uh, point carry symmetry, when I look at it from the Carolian perspective, there's an infinite dimensional uh, 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 extension of the point carry symmetry group into this BMS type group, right? So uh, it's even true for conformal theory projected on all surfaces that you have this infinite dimensional extension. Um, of the symmetry. And so that's why we can do a lot more because we have much more symmetry than, uh, than we're used to there. Um, okay, so, yep. No, it doesn't, dip. it's very general. We're going to see that. We're going to see that, yeah. So the time dependency, we, Okay, if I have time, I'll, I'll show you that. The time dependency means mean just that the, there's going to be a, a, a energy associated with that time dependency. Spin two and spin zero uh, uh, stresses. Yeah. No, you don't, we don't need that because the gravity just always takes care of it of itself. That, that's the spin zero, yeah. yeah. If it's, if it's non-killing, then you're activating the spin zero degrees of freedom that still makes sure you, the symmetry is preserved. I hope I have time to. Okay, so let's say two things we can do now is that, okay, I, I was mentioning what does it mean to do quantum gravity. Along the way to quantum gravity, one thing you have to accept is that the notion of how you label points, position, time, has to become operators. Right? So there's, there's something in between, let's say, usual field theory and quantum gravity, which is, I would, I would call, quantum field theory with quantum reference frame. And here, it's very nice that, uh, uh, but to, to have a quantum reference frame, you need to pull out the notion of a clock. Uh, and usually, it's very complicated to find out what is this reference clock you use. Here in the null surface, it's a beauty, this kind of a unique choice that simplifies everything. So uh, if we go back, there was this uh, surface tension that I... Uh, was the variable conjugated to the area form, but also for people who have forgotten, you know, was this definition uh, from the expansion and the, uh, uh, and the surface gravity term. So there's a natural surface tension. That surface tension transforms anomalously under, under time reparametrization, the dv square, like a Schwarzian uh, uh, transformation here. So what it means, it means that we can use this, trade this mu for a dynamical time variable. And so the, 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 the the final conclusion is that suppose you, you introduce this variable v here, which is such that its second, deri second the logarithmic derivative is mu. Okay? It determines v up to the, what I was saying, the value of v at the corner and its first derivative, which are going to be this edge mode variable. And once we have this variable, which is kind of a, a Wilson line of mu, you can construct it as a Wilson line of this, uh, of this uh, pressure uh, answer, then you can construct gauge invariant observable. And you have the full algebra uh, of gauge invariant, I mean, the full sets of uh, gauge invariant uh, observable. Not only you have the sets of gauge invariant observable, but I can compute their algebra now. Remember, this object is an operator, it's going to become an operator, V is an operator. So when I want to compute the commutator of this with D, I have to commute this with this, but also V with Q, and et cetera, et cetera. And remarkably, this can be done at the classical level, non perturbatively, to all order in G Newton. Okay? And uh, so this is this notion of dressing time, is that, that when you have a gravitational field, there's kind of a, the notion of time has to be pulled out from the gravitational field itself. Okay, and this dressing time, an important thing is that it differs from affine time when theta, when the expansion does not vanish. And that explains in most of the literature, what people do is that they put, they choose the affine time classically and then they go on quantization and then they can never get the right answer for what is the entropy because they forgot that that object because of Heisenberg commutation relation, you cannot fix it classically. It has a conjugate variable. If you fix it, imagine that you fix classically the affine time. What you're doing is that you're completely delocalizing the conjugate variable, which means the area. So you're telling me that the fluctuation of the area is infinite. This is not possible. So one thing to remember is that Heisenberg is very powerful. You cannot uh, classically impose variable uh, uh, without paying the price, okay? So uh, this is why in the most of the literature, nobody talks about this time variable. Uh, because they, they fix it, but that's not, that's not uh, acceptable for 
for someone that wants to put the H bar later. Yeah. A fine time is k kappa equals zero. Kappa, yeah. Uh, kappa, which I, I call the surface gravity, is also the, the infinity of the null ray, the acceleration of L. Okay. Yeah, yeah, up to this choice of cut. Yeah, like, like the affine time. It's like an affine time, except that it, it's the same as the affine time if you're non expanding, but it's a generalization of affine time if you're uh, an expanding surface. Yeah, 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 that's, that's what I'm talking. There's this edge mode. Yeah, yeah. I, I have to fix my, my initial uh, reference. Yeah. Uh, v and its first derivative at the cut. Yeah. Right. That, that's, the, that's the new, if you want, this is the edge mode variable I have to add to my phase space for people who are, you know, I'm trying to not include the edge mode, but here they kind of sneak in because there's boundary condition on, on, on the definition of time. Absolutely. And then, then, then they are part of the phase space. They have to be. I mean, there's no way, anyway, there's no way you can quantize gravity without understanding the quantization of the of the cuts there. Uh, okay, but we're going to see that. So now we, uh, we can compute the bracket of the gauge invariant observable. Remember the tilde are the gauge invariant observable. Uh, and, and quite remarkably, I mean, the result is very simple. The, the, the derivation is a miracle of cancellation. In the end, that's the way it should be. But essentially, uh, what you have is that after you, you repackage everything in terms of this gauge invariant observable, the, the, the Coulombic mode disappears from the symplectic structure. You're just left with the radiative mode. And if you have matter, let's say, the matter terms there. And then essentially all the spin zero degrees of freedom are, are, are encoded into this uh, 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 variation of the time, delta V, V minus one is the Moer carton form for the deformorphism symmetry you're, you're using. And the conjugate variable is the constraints, which is as it should be, the time should be in some sense conjugate to the constraints in the body, okay? Uh, so and this is the constraints in dressing time. Very importantly, because now mu is equal to zero in the dressing time, this is what the constraint looks like. Much simpler, and this is, this is very important because this object is positive. Um, now, if we just look at the corner charge, this is what we're uh, viewing, is that the corner charge depends on the value of this Moer carton form and its first derivative, which are the two edge mode variables, which are now uh, are activated at the corner. Okay, and then what we see also is that uh, the boost time, so the boost time is always the value of time, which let's say, uh, uh, chi vanish the boundary, then we see that the boost time is conjugated to the area form, and we recover this very old famous result that we know that somehow, you know, the, the boost, I mean, we know that the boost charge should be proportional to the area, which is the entropy. And we're going to see that in fact, it's, it's, uh, it's what, we, what, we, what we get. Okay, so why does it matter here? Um, so what, one mechanism for why, why we care so much about understanding the fluctuation of time is that we know that gravity is non-renormalizable, right? Okay, which means that we have a unreconcilable UV divergences as effective fee theory. But now, uh, the point is that in quantum gravity, you know, when you look at uh, localization of a point, you have to kind of uh, use a, a, a field to tell me where this point is. And generically, the, the fact that this, uh, this position is a, is a field operator means that if you try to localize this field operator, you include, you're going to include dispersion. So there's naturally always a softening of the divergences, the UV divergences due to the presence of, of this uh, quantum reference frame. And recently, there's a lot of a noise made around the fact that, so essentially what I'm saying is that if delta V now uh, is not fluctuating, if it was a classical field, it means I can pinpoint exactly where I locate my surface, but in, in, in quantum mechanics, I cannot do that. The conjugate variable of the, of the time here is called the boost uh, time. The boost operator is also the modular Hamiltonian. And, and in, in QFT, the modular Hamiltonian fluctuation is always infinite. This is one of the fundamental foundations of the UV divergences. Here, uh, you can show that this uh, fluctuation of modular Hamiltonian is finite simply because you, you allow uh, a fluctuation in time. And this is the famous uh, cross product reduction from type three to type two, okay? But it's very physical. If you allow time to fluctuate, less divergences. Um, Okay, uh, let, let me finish maybe looking more at uh, 
one of the things we, we want to look at is that we want to look at, yep. Yep. It's built in, that's the point. So it, exactly, in, in written story, it's, be, no, that's the beauty. This is the, yeah. In fact, the origin of all this story about edge mode is that in gravity, the cross product is, is built in to, to deal with the constant, yes. That's, that's the message, it's, yeah. The observer is, is part of the, is the Newtonian potential, if you like, okay? Yeah, but even in the sitter, in some sense, I mean, it, it, literally, this whole story only makes sense because of gravity. Gravity has edge modes, which are these reference frames. Like they, this is the only way you make sense of of, of something. It's very, very. Once you understand that, you understand, in essence, why suddenly gravity is fundamentally different than than QFT. Very simple. Uh, uh, it's, it's a key element of of quantum gravity. It's not the full quantum gravity, but a key element. Yeah, except that it's pale point. It's much more general. Witten is, is cooked up here. Here it comes absolutely naturally, like effortlessly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Of course, of course, that's what we're constructing. So we can construct now the Hamiltonian of that system. Let's say the boost charge. If you give me a cut and you try to look at this uh, vector field that vanish at the cut, okay, that would be like the, the splitting uh, vector field, the boost Hamiltonian. Then uh, you can compute it. So in, in the case of the horizon, when the expansion vanish, we know that we expect this vector field to be the area element, right? That's the usual result that defines the entropy. Here, uh, what we have uh, is we have something which is uh, uh, one minus V dV of omega. And by V, I mean this particular dressing time, not any other, because otherwise this will not be covariant. And the main claim, of course, it looks like uh, one minus beta d beta log z. So this, this time plays the role of, so this is, and this object uh, we claim is, is what plays the role of, of dynamical entropy for arbitrary expanding cut. One of the things you can prove from there is that if you use this dressing time and the form of the constraints, you have essentially that, uh, uh, um, uh, um, you know, the fact that the time derivative of this, of this uh, entropy uh, increases. And that was the challenge. Before, it was only possible to prove that for non-expanding horizon, this can be done for arbitrary non-expanding horizon. And it suggests that the boost charges is exactly the modular Hamiltonian. It's not a proof of it, because you need to, to go beyond. But it, it, it strongly suggests that you know, this correspondence between boost charges and modular Hamiltonian is kind of built in the gravitational principle. I call that the quantum equivalence principle, something that is a profound connection between geometrical entropy the notion of entropy and the notion of, uh, of symmetry charges. Um, okay, let me skip. Uh, the only thing, okay, maybe the only thing I can say there is that if you want to think about quantization, goes back to one question that was there, uh, the proper way to see the, uh, uh, at the quantum level to understand a ratio degree is really to, to see it as a, as a balanced law between uh, three stress tensors, okay? So you have a, we have a stress tensor due to the uh, uh, Coulombic degrees of freedom, the spin zero. We have a stress tensor due to the, the, gravi the graviton, which would be zero if it was uh, time. And then we have a stress tensor due to matter. And essentially, the, cons the, the, the ratio degree equation tells me it's like a string equation. It tells me that the, the total stress tensor should vanish. Okay, and that's Einstein's equation. And now, because of ultralocality, this is a chiral CFT on each line ray. Okay, so this is what uh, ratio degree uh, 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 reduces to. Each null ray carries a carol CFT. And of course, uh, gravity, uh, it's not conformally invariant, but, but the, the constraints equations of gravity expresses the fact that it reduces to a carol CFT. And the reason it does is because I've introduced now 
new degrees of freedom, I mean, it's not I, it's gravity introduced degrees of freedom which are quantum geometrical degrees of freedom, okay? If you do usual fee theory, this object is not zero, and demanding T2 plus T matter equal to zero is very, very bizarre and very constrained. But here it's kind of generic. Every, every quantum gravitational state needs to have that. Okay, I'm going to skip the, okay. Yes. Yep. Presumably, yeah, yeah, here we are at null surfaces. We haven't done the mapping to BMS, but uh, uh, yeah, so the, at the quantum level, there is a central charge that, okay, you, okay. Thank you for the question. But, uh, <laughs> I'm supposed to be done, but that, that's essentially, so uh, this is a non-perturbative result, right? With non-perturbatively, you can show that this is the full, uh, uh, you know, let's say, uh, the, the quantum gravity algebra needs to have a representation. So unlike string theory, the central charge, the total central charge is not zero. The total central charge is essentially uh, a central charge that, you know, you have one central charge per null generator, and then a factor n, which count the number of points on the cut, okay? So if you try to do this, uh, quantization perturbatively, what you find is that the number of points on the cut is infinite, of course. And that's the source of all UV divergences. So the reason you have UV divergences is because in a, in a QFT, there's no built-in uh, uh, regulator, and then you can pile up in your Adama state a, as much state as you want in terms of this transverse UV. So one of the conjecture uh, that we have, or let's say, you know, for me, what is quantum gravity? Quantum gravity is a theory which has a representation of, of, uh, of uh, uh, this Carroll CFT algebra with finite central charge, okay? That's the proper way to talk about a regulator that doesn't break the symmetry, okay? If you do the calculation at infinity, you're going to find that the, the two-point function of the stress tensor at the cut is also infinite. In fact, there's, a, there's an infinite central charge, okay? So here, uh, quantum gravity is finite central charge. And now, you know, I don't know what quantum gravity is, but now I can think about something effectively where I can, I can think about a, a state of representation that fixes the central charge. So there's a new number in the game coming from quantization on our way, which is this N operator, which is essentially the maximum number of points I can put on my, on my cross uh, sphere. Yeah. And then we have a model that is going to come, which we call molecular quantization, uh, where essentially you postulate that the area form as, as the area form is like a volume form. And um, it goes back to an idea of uh, Landau. Landau uh, found uh, uh, molecules as quantization of fluid. A perfect fluid is an Hamiltonian system. If you quantize it, guess what? You find uh, the constituents of the, of the fluid. So here we do the same thing. Simple idea, but it's kind of cute that in fact, Quantizing the fluid, not treating it as an effective object, but treating it as an Hamiltonian system, you get a natural uh, uh, regularization for, uh, for, for that central charge. Okay. And then, uh, okay, that's why I talked about ratio theory as a Carolian conservation law, as a Carroll CFT, very briefly. Uh, the symplectic analysis can be fully done, and we have this kind of dressing time and monotonicity and what I was saying, there's a way to think about UV finiteness in a, in a new way where I don't break the symmetry. You see, I don't impose a cutoff. I just, I just, I just control the density of my uh, uh, constituents, in fact, the constituents of the Carolian fluid. Um, and here, okay, we have done only, you know, we have looked at GVV, which is we have the time. And now we're working on GVA. We're going to have the position. And then finally, we need to have the normal embedding. And then maybe we'll have all the edge mode variable, but one step at a time. Thank you.